Good evening, everyone. I am delighted to have you joining me once again for another one of our midweek Bible studies. We're continuing this evening our study that we began last week in the letter of Paul to Thessalonica, the first uh, first letter to the Thessalonians. As we come to the second chapter of this letter, we find Paul, as I mentioned last week in the introduction to this letter, defending his ministry among them, as brief as it had been, together with emphasizing the impact that the gospel had achieved there. The opening verses, uh, the opening words of verse 1, for you yourselves know, is an emphatic expression. It suggests that the evidence for what he's about to say about the lasting results of his short visit to Thessalonica is an incontrovertible fact that would stand up in any court of law. And Paul addresses these believers once more with the endearing terms of brothers and sisters to underscore the shared connection that they enjoy as members of God's forever family. He then proceeds to say what they know to be a fact, that the visit by the missionaries to Thessalonica wasn't in vain. It wasn't without result. It wasn't a failure or empty or a waste of time, as various English translations express this phrase. As we saw last week, the gospel had made significant inroads among the citizens there, with many coming to faith in Christ, and later the gospel being extended throughout all of Greece and even beyond its borders through the witnesses of these new converts. Paul tells them in verse 2 that not only was their visit to Thessalonica not useless or in vain, but the results of their ministry stood in sharp contrast with what might have been the expected outcome given their arrival in the city fresh from the hardships that they endured in Philippi, the suffering of shameful beatings and imprisonment to which Paul and Silas had been subjected there uh, before God sent an earthquake, earthquake that threw open uh, the, their prison doors and released them from their bonds and shackles. And one might have anticipated that such harsh treatment would lead them to become fearful and cautious when they came to Thessalonica. But just the opposite was true. Paul tells them that they were actually emboldened to speak the gospel among uh, the Thessalonians, even amid great opposition. Now, we don't know for sure if some of their adversaries, the Jewish opponents, had followed them to Thessalonica from Philippi. Uh, That would not be a rarity because that was a frequent occurrence on Paul's missionary journeys. It would not be unexpected for them to have done so. These opponents, as we mentioned last week, stirred the crowd up into an angry mob that attacked the home of Jason, their host. Uh, Were Paul and Silas not to have been utterly convinced of the truth of the gospel with its message of Jesus' death and resurrection, in all likelihood they would have turned tail and run, (laughs) fled back to Antioch at the first sign of trouble in Thessalonica after all that they'd suffered in Philippi. But to the contrary, they boldly continued preaching the good news of Christ that in turn inspired these new believers to imitate them in their fearless commitment to spread the gospel. In Paul's defense of his ministry among them, in verse 3, he denies that the source of his preaching or exhortation was in any way related to error, impurity, or an attempt to deceive these, his listeners. There were many false prophets who had arisen in, in the course of human history, and especially in the history of Israel, and that trend was to be continued in the New Testament era as well. Jesus had warned his disciples to beware of false prophets, uh, in Matthew 7, 15, Matthew 24, 11, and Matthew 24, 24, he had warned of the appearance and coming of false prophets. And by the time Peter and John write their epistles, both of them speak of false prophets having already appeared on the scene. Second Peter 2, 1 and 1 John 4, 1 uh, mention the appearance of these false prophets. But Paul denies that his message is in any way the byproduct of error or of human invention. He affirms that he's received that message from the Lord himself. Paul adds that there's been no deception underlying his message. False prophets would often attempt to deceive others to enrich themselves or to mislead folks, but Paul denies any such under motives in his preaching. In a parallel passage in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 2, Paul writes these words, But we have renounced the things hidden because of shame, not walking in craftiness or adulterating the word of God, but by the manifestation of truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. To adulterate something is to mix in impurities with the genuine article. And Paul says he's not been guilty of doing that. Let me pause just half a second. 
I had forgotten to silence my phone here in the office. Um, so Paul says that he's not been guilty of human error or deceit. Paul introduces verse 4 with a word of contrast, but instead or rather to indicate the sharp difference between how he has ministered among the Thessalonians compared to others whose motives were impure or suspect. He affirms that he and his missionary com uh, companions have been approved by God their lives pass the test of being honest and faithful servants of the Lord rather than those who are pursuing personal gain or advantage. Paul adds that his approval by God entails them having been entrusted with the gospel. It's difficult to conceive of any greater mission or purpose being placed in one's hands than the task of sharing the good news of Christ and the forgiveness of sin that's to be found in Jesus Christ. Paul will later challenge Timothy, his companion on this missionary journey, to study or be diligent to present himself approved to God as one who doesn't need to be ashamed, but who handles accurately the word of truth. He writes that to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.15. Since his goal has been to be approved by the Lord as one entrusted with the gospel message, Paul goes on to clarify in verse 4 that he isn't hung up on trying to please men with the message he speaks, but rather to please God, since he's the only one who truly knows and examines our hearts. You know, we can perhaps attempt to fool others with our hypocrisy to try to pull the wool over their eyes regarding our own motives, but Paul says we cannot deceive the all-seeing and all-knowing God. And that reality prompted Paul to speak the truth of the gospel with sincerity and integrity rather than attempting to please men or win their approval. Paul continues that same theme of the purity and sincerity of his message and ministry among them in verses 5 through 6 where he declares he hadn't come to them with flattering speech or greedy motives. Flattering speech is that which is designed to ingratiate oneself with his or her listeners to say what they want to hear. It's not genuine or perhaps even relevant to their needs, but only designed to win their approval by appealing to some ulterior purpose, uh, concealing that uh, that's suggested by the phrase here with a pretext for greed. And I can't read these verses without thinking of the abusive practice of so many well-known tele-evangelists who prey on their audiences with the false gospel of wealth and prosperity that's designed to enrich their own pockets to purchase mansions and private jets for them. Paul says that there is a twofold witness to the truth of his words regarding the purity of his motives. The Thessalonians, who personally know of his lifestyle based on the time he spent among them, and the witness of God himself. That statement really reiterates what Paul said in the preceding verse about God examining our hearts. Paul won't alter the gospel message to win men's approval, and that's something that he would warn Timothy against also in 2 Timothy 4, 2 through 4, where he says this, Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. Paul declares in verse 6 that he and his missionary colleagues weren't in the business of building up their own personal empire or of making a name for themselves as they, thought, as they sought the glory or praise of men. Paul consistently displayed hum humility in his dealing with new believers. He chose to brag about his weaknesses rather than his strengths. We see that in 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5, as he recounts how he came to the believers in Corinth. He says, when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my message and preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. Paul will likewise say in 2 Corinthians 10, 17, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. And in what could well be a, a life verse for the apostle, he tells the Galatians in Galatians 6, 14, but may it never be that I would boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus, through whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. It's interesting that different English translations place the phrase that follows about Paul saying he and his companions have chosen 
not to be a burden to them, though they could well have asserted their authority as apostles. Uh, various English translations have that phrase in either verse 6 or verse 7. And regardless of where it is, and, and let me just say as a quick aside here, that chapter and verse divisions in the scriptures were a much later uh, addition to the scriptures to help readers locate and find specific texts. Uh, they themselves are not inspired. But the thrust of, this, of the statement is the same, whether in your Bible it's included in verse 5 or verse 6 or verse 7. Paul says, in effect, if anyone had the right, the right to assert their authority as a as an apostle of Christ, it was him. He suffered and endured so many hardships as an apostle and as a missionary, he could well have insisted on some special privileges and treatments, but he consistently rejected that approach. If you want to study Paul's teaching on this, in 1 Corinthians 9, verses 3 through 18, it is a lengthy description of Paul of the right of ministers and Christian workers to earn their living from their labors. He says soldiers don't serve at their own expense. They receive a salary. He speaks of those who tend a vineyard being entitled to eat from its fruit, of those who keep a flock being permitted to enjoy the milk of the animals uh, that they're under their care. Nevertheless, Paul says he's chosen not to ex exercise that privilege in order not to be a burden to those among whom he is serving. Paul was a tent maker. When he came to Corinth, he engaged in that activity along with Priscilla and Aquila so as not to burden the congregation there uh, and ask them to provide for his livelihood. You can read of that in Acts chapter 18, verses 1 through 4. Rather than demanding his way and asserting his apostolic authority among them, Paul tells them in verse 7 that he and his fellow missionaries proved to be gentle among them, like a nursing mother who tenderly cares for her own children. It's difficult, if not impossible, to imagine a more tender image than that of a nursing mother who gently and lovingly cares for her infant child. Obviously, Paul is writing in an age long before baby bottles and formula existed and all babies were breastfed. And that intimate connection between mother and child is a beautiful picture of how Paul understood his role as a nurturer of the faith of these new believers, these babes in Christ. Unless we think it's inappropriate for Paul to utilize a feminine image to uh, describe his care for these new believers, we find God himself in the Old Testament on various occasions employing that same notion of a mother caring for her offspring to describe his own care for his people Israel. We read, for example, in Hosea 11, uh, verses 3 and 4, God's words through the prophet, It was I who taught Ephraim to walk, taking them by the arms, but they did not realize it was I who healed them. I led them with cords of human kindness, with ties of love. To them, I was like the one who lifts a little child to the cheek, and I bent down to feed them. Indirectly, God invokes that same imagery in Isaiah 49, 15, saying, Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you. God similarly says in Isaiah 66, 13, as a mother comforts her child, so I will comfort you, and you will be comforted over O Jerusalem. As David describes his own relationship with the Lord, he writes in Psalm 131, verse 2, But I have calmed and quieted myself. I am like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child, I am content. That tender image of the nursing mother is carried over into Paul's statement in verse 8 about how he and his missionary colleagues have esteemed and, evalu and, and valued these new believers in Thessalon Thessalonica. He tells them that the missionaries felt such a strong affection and deep love for them that they were well pleased, or some versions say delighted, to share not only the gospel message with them, but also their very lives because these Thessalonians had become so dear to them. Paul doesn't view these new believers as another notch on his spiritual revolver as he tallies up converts for Christ. There's not some just abstract transaction that's taking place here, but a profound experience of sacrificially sharing their very lives with these new believers, these new brothers and sisters in Christ. Paul views them as members of his own family in the body of Christ. In verses 9 and 10, Paul Paul evidently feels the need to repeat what he's just written to them uh, to underscore the nature of his ministry among them. He writes once more that he had chosen not to be a burden to them, but labored night and day in order to preach to them the gospel of God. Now in verse, 
chapter 1, verse 5, he had referred to our gospel. But twice in, in chapter 2, in verse 2 and again verse 9, Paul speaks of the good news as the gospel of God. Now, he has certainly personalized it as his own. He can refer to it as our gospel or my gospel. But he clearly acknowledges that the message has its origin in God the Father who loves the world and sent his Son to be the Redeemer of sinful humanity. In verse 10, Paul further reiterates the twofold appeal that he had made earlier in verse 5 to both the Thessalonians and God himself as witnesses to the kinds of men the missionary team had been among them, having conducted themselves devoutly or uprightly and righteously and blamelessly. No charges of deceit or greed or laziness or any other criticism could really be lodged against Paul, Silas, and Timothy for how they had served in Thessalonica. In verses 11 through 12, Paul shifts the gender role from the earlier description of a nursing mother to now describe the missionary's role among these new believers in terms of a father who guides and directs his children. That paternal leadership took the form of encouraging, exhorting, comforting, and imploring them to walk in a manner worthy of the God who called them into his kingdom and his glory. And we've seen in our previous studies of Paul's letters that he loves to use the verb walk to describe the Christian life. Paul says we walk by faith and not by sight in 2 Corinthians 5, 7. He says that we're to walk by the Spirit so as not to carry out the desires of the flesh in Galatians 5, 16. In Ephesians 5, 2, he says to walk in love. In, in 5, 8, in Ephesians, he says to walk as children of the light. He tells us in Colossians 2, 6, to walk in Christ. And as he says here in verse 12, as well as in Ephesians 4, 1 and in Colossians 1, 10, we're to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. The lives of these new believers in Thessalonica were on display before their pagan neighbors, and Paul urges them to live distinctly, to no longer live according to the patterns of this world and their fallen sinful nature. The Holy Spirit living within them will give them the power to resist temptation, to live a life of holiness if they'll only allow him to fill and control their hearts moment by moment throughout each day. And that's the same challenge we have as 21st century believers, isn't it? May we commit ourselves to walking in the power of the Holy Spirit each day that God permits us to live. Thank you for joining me in this study this evening, and I look forward to seeing you this coming Lord's Day. Let's conclude our time this evening in a word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the ministry that Paul and Silas and Timothy had among the Thessalonians, for the, the paternal and maternal aspects of their care, the tenderness with which they shepherded these new believers, but also uh, the diligence with which they exhorted and implored them to walk in a manner worthy of their calling as followers of Christ. May we too let your light shine through us as your Holy Spirit empowers us to be your witnesses and to resist the temptations that come knocking at our door, that we might be found worthy of the calling to be your disciples and your followers. Uh, bless my listeners, these friends, and, and brothers and sisters in Christ is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. And once again, look forward to seeing you this coming Sunday.